Welcome everyone. Welcome to a call, a call to action on methane, an international dialogue hosted by the Global Methane Initiative. Thank you for joining us today. I am Monica Shimamura, Director of the Secretariat of the Global Methane Initiative. Before we get started, let's review a few housekeeping items. First tip, maximize your browser window to make sure that you can see all the controls. This is especially important if you want to use the closed caption feature. Your audio is controlled by the device you are using to join this event. For example, your cell phone, your smartphone, desktop computer or tablet. If you're experiencing trouble with the sound or audio, turn up the volume or the device you are on the device you're using. Make sure your device is not muted. This event will be conducted in English and closed captions are available in Chinese, French, Indonesian, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. On the bottom right corner of your window, click the, the CC button or the closed caption button to turn on the live captions. Use the tool button right next to the closed caption button or the CC button to select the language of your choice. A note about the captions, these are live captions that are automatically generated in real time as the speaker, speakers are talking. They will not be 100% accurate. Lastly, a recording of today's event will be made available on the Global Methane Initiative's website. I'm very pleased now to introduce Helen Ryan. Helen is the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister of the Environmental Protection Branch at Environment and Climate Change Canada and Chair of the Global Methane Initiative's Steering Committee. Madam Chair, I'm turning this over to you now. Thanks very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. My name is Helen Ryan. As you just heard, I'm the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister of Environment Protection Branch at Environment and Climate Change Canada. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking to you here in Gatineau, Quebec, Canada, is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. As chair of the Global Methane Initiative Steering Committee, I am delighted to welcome you to today's event, which we've named a call to action on methane, an international dialogue <clears throat> hosted by the GMI. I look forward to hearing from our speakers on their perspective and insight on the importance, the opportunities and challenges of methane mit mitigation. Today's event is extremely timely. As the world works to overcome a pandemic of global proportion, we are here to talk about an solutions to another global crisis. Climate change represents an existential threat. The IPPC has been clear that we cannot hope to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius without taking significant action on methane in the next few years. And as the window of opportunity to take meaningful action narrows, so too does our ability to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Methane is both a potent greenhouse gas and a short-lived climate pollutant. According to the Global Carbon Project, Methane is the second most important greenhouse gas contributing to climate change. It's responsible for about 23% of global warming produced by all greenhouse gases. It's also a precursor to harmful ground level ozone and as a result has significant human health effects. And since methane only stays in the atmosphere for a decade or so, mitigating methane is one of the few ways we can slow the rate of warming in the near term. However, taking action on methane is not just about mitigating climate change. It's also about economic opportunity because methane is a valuable energy source. Rather than allowing methane to escape into the atmosphere, it can be captured to yield both economic and environmental benefits. Repairing methane leaks in the oil and gas sector, for example, retains valuable natural gas that companies can then sell. Exciting technological developments in the methane capture and use show that methane can play an important role 
in the decarbonization of our economies. We're also seeing the interesting development of new technologies and tools that can be used to find methane leaks at different scales, from satellite observation at the continental scale to easily deployable drones to monitor local operating sites, operation sites. Our gl Global Methane Initiative partners recognize this potential. They recognize that there are existing solutions and opportunities to address methane, and they've been undertaking outstanding work to mitigate methane. Here are a few examples of what the GMI has achieved since it was created in 2004. 70 countries have hosted activities where approximately 50,000 people receive more than 225,000 hours of training on reducing methane emissions and capturing methane for productive uses. GMI has partnered with 45 countries and hundreds of private sector and multilateral partners to reduce methane emissions by more than 454 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. While these are remarkable achievements, more can be done. I am pleased to announce that the GMI has recently adopted new terms of reference and has renewed its charter for another 10 years. Canada has been proud member of the Global Methane Initiative since 2005 and co-chair since 2016. Canada will be continuing in its role as chair for another term. I'd like to speak briefly about Canada's approach to methane mitigation. Canada is also proud to be taking action on methane, putting into practice the very best practices, excuse me, the very best available techniques and a robust regulatory regime. Canada is committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050 by investing in clean technology and taking action through regulations and incentives. We are also committed to continuing to take a leadership role, including by sharing our solutions with the world to demonstrate how action to reduce methane emissions can spur innovation and clean job creation. One exciting area of Canadian-led science is in the monitoring and measurement of methane sources. Working with clean technology innovators will allow us to detect large amounts of methane sources and measure the progress of our efforts. Canadian innovators are at the forefront in this area. We're providing ground-based solutions developed by members of the Methane Emissions Leadership Alliance or space-based monitoring via GHG sat satellite technologies. Momentum has been growing since Canada committed in, tw in 2016 to reduce methane emissions from the oil and gas sector to 40 to 45 percent below 2012 levels by 2025. Canada recognizes that reducing methane emissions from Canada's oil and gas operations is one of the lowest cost actions to reduce greenhouse gases from the energy sector. Canadian provinces of Saskatchewan, Alberta and British Columbia, Columbia have all taken action to address methane from their respective oil and gas operations. Canada is one of the first countries in the world to regulate methane emissions from the oil and gas sector at a national level. Our methane regulations are key to tackling climate change from Canada's largest industrial emission source. They provide the oil and gas industry with compliance options and opportunities for innovation. In addition to methane regulation, our approach also includes complementary initiatives. For instance, the Emission Reduction Fund provides funding to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the oil and gas sector with an emphasis on methane. As well, we are developing a clean fuel standard to reduce emissions from liquid fossil fuels, which can include incentives for reductions of certain methane emissions. Canada is making strong progress towards its 2025 goal, <clears throat> and we believe enhancements in clean technology allow for a more ambitious 2030 methane reduction policy. That's why the Strength and Climate Plan, introduced in December 2020, introduces a goal to achieve deeper methane reductions, a goal guided by the International Energy Agency's analysis that member, <coughs> excuse me, that member countries should target a 60 to 75 percent emissions reductions by the end of the decade. And it's one of the reasons why Prime Minister Trudeau announced in April that Canada will enhance its Paris Agreement target, aiming to reduce GHG emissions by 40 to 45 percent by 2030. As you know, the oil and gas 
is not the only sector where we can mitigate methane emissions. Canada is supporting through Canada's Low Carbon Economy Fund a number of climate projects that are diverting organic waste and expanding landfill gas collection systems. As part of our Strength and Climate Plan, we will also be developing national regulations for landfill gas capture from large landfills. Despite much progress made by several countries, including Canada, in addressing methane, we are here today because methane remains a global problem and emissions are continuing to rise in many parts of the world. And we understand that collaboration is absolutely key to progress. With the United States now re-engaged on climate change, the global dynamics are changing and we must seize the opportunity to work together to achieve greater progress. That's why I'm pleased that we're joined today by Acting Assistant Administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Joseph Goffman. Our two countries recognize that further emissions reductions are both feasible and essential to making rapid progress in fighting climate change. This April, our two countries issued a roadmap for a renewed U.S.-Canada partnership, committing both of our countries to achieving ambitious methane emissions reductions in the oil and gas sector and other sectors. We will work together to increase domestic requirements for methane reduction and to raise global ambition for methane mitigation. As a global community, the shift towards a low carbon future is already underway. We're collectively improved our ability to measure methane emissions and quantify their impacts. We've developed cost-effective mitigation solutions and some countries have put measures in place to regulate or incentivize the implementation of these solutions. We will need to work hard as a global community to achieve methane reductions required to meet our collective Paris Agreement goals. Together, we can advance our economic and environmental goals, even in the midst of a crisis. Today, you will hear from a variety of influential leaders with keynote addresses and an industry panel discussion with moderated Q's and A's. We've got a great team, a great program for you. So let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today will kick us off with a keynote address on methane mitigation policy to achieve, to achieve climate goals. I am pleased to introduce Joseph Goffman, Acting Assistant Administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Joseph has extensive experience in climate, air, and energy, having served previously in the OAR as an Associate Assistant Administrator for Climate and Senior Counsel. He has provided legal counsel and policy advice on a wide range of climate policy and Clean Air Act regulatory and implementation issues. Joseph has previously served as the Executive Director of the Environmental Energy Law Program at Harvard Law School. Joseph, I turn the floor over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you very much, Helen, for the introduction and for that great kickoff. It's an opportunity, it's a great honor and a great opportunity to be here today. And speaking on behalf of the US Environmental Protection Agency and the Biden Harris administration, it is delightful to be able to share with you my perspective on one way that the global community can make a difference to address the climate change challenge. And that is by working together to reduce methane emissions globally. The United States has re-entered the Paris Agreement with its goal of limiting the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. To accomplish such an ambitious goal, the, more, the world must work together to reduce greenhouse ga gas emissions. Of course, we cannot focus just on carbon dioxide. We must also address other greenhouse gases, and in particular, emissions of methane, a highly potent greenhouse gas. 
global methane emissions have substantially risen over the past decade. And because methane is a powerful, immediate climate forcer, reducing methane emissions now can have immediate effects on the global climate. The United States supports the Global Methane Initiative's call to action to reduce methane emissions from oil and gas production, from coal mining, from livestock waste, from landfills, and from wastewater treatment plants. Methane emissions are an important contributor to climate change, and methane emissions can also exacerbate air quality problems and create industry safety hazards. There's good, no, good news though, and that is that there are already many cost-effective technologies to monitor, abate, and capture methane emissions for use as an energy source. Recovering and using methane can provide energy and economic benefits, a classic win-win. For example, coal mines can recover the methane that poses an explosion hazard to miners and sell it to natural gas pipeline operators. Oil and gas companies can save money and increase their efficiency by not wasting methane, the key constituent, the key constituent of their product. Farms can use methane from livestock waste to create a source of energy as well as valuable products such as soil fertilizer. And landfills can generate revenue from upgrading landfill gas for use as vehicle fuel. Addressing the global methane emissions challenge, like addressing the challenge of climate change itself, requires, <clears throat> excuse me, taking global action. Reducing methane now will buy us time to put into place longer term strategies to address carbon dioxide. Reducing methane on a global scale can support the development of innovative technologies, providing future generations a cleaner and safer environment while creating jobs and supporting economic development. Meaningful global action on methane starts with meaningful action at the national level, both at home as well as with our international partners. The United States will take methane reducing actions to help combat climate change, recover an otherwise wasted resource, and provide economic benefits. The U.S. will continue to demonstrate our leadership on climate change, including methane mitigation at home and abroad. Addressing methane presents a unique opportunity to strengthen our economy by, as President Biden says, building back better and ensuring a healthy and equitable environment. The Biden-Harris administration has already taken significant steps on climate and methane. During his first days in office, President Biden issued a series of executive orders that gave federal agencies, including the Environmental Protection Agency, direction to use the best science to protect the environment and public health, to ensure access to clean air, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and to bolster resilience to the impacts of climate change. For example, EPA has already begun moving forward to reinstate regulations designed to limit climate warming methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. And the administration is implementing a whole of government approach through actions by the Department of Energy, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Transportation, all to find ways to address methane. EPA will continue to rely upon our world-renowned reporting mechanism, EPA's Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program, which enables us to track methane and other greenhouse gases down to the facility level. And of course, we will continue to work with our partnership programs to support methane reducing activities from landfills, farms, and the oil and gas sector. Uh, we will do so by sharing learning and best practices 
with a growing network of partners. And we will do so by recognizing companies that are going above and beyond requirements to reduce methane through new initiatives and innovative strategies and technologies. These programs and our industry partners have led to improvement in technologies and approaches to monitoring and controlling methane emissions that are cost effective and protective of human health and in the environment. The United States is proud of our collaboration with our international partners and our leadership to advance methane mitigation on a global scale, especially through our efforts with the Global Methane Initiative. This public-private partnership has been active since 2004, focusing on reducing the barriers to methane mitigation around the world. Through the Global Methane Initiative, the U.S and our 44 partner countries and hundreds of private sector partners have made great strides to advance our understanding of how to mitigate methane in key sectors. Since 2004, Global Methane Initiative partners have implemented more than 1,100 methane mitigation sectoral projects across the globe. These projects have reduced methane emissions by more than 450 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. I'd like to share a few examples of successful actions that EPA, with the support of the State Department, has undertaken with our GMI partners to reduce global methane emissions. Let's start in the city of Gurugram, India. The city needed assistance in understanding its waste streams to plan appropriate treatment facilities. EPA led a waste characterization study that showed that the city needed to divert organic waste from landfills, which was causing high methane emissions. The EPA team developed a guide on how to design and implement a waste characterization study and trained an in-country team. EPA, in fact, has been training and empowering cities across the world ever since in order to understand better and therefore address their waste streams. In China, in the coal sector, the world's largest emitter of coal mine methane, since, nine, since 2004, EPA has provided technical assistance and built capacity in China to identify opportunities to reduce methane. EPA has conducted 30 feasibility and pre-feasibility studies at coal mines in China, provided funding and technical expertise to the China Coal Bed, coal bed Methane Clearinghouse, an in-country resource for coal bed methane mitigation, and conducted many technical workshops and trainings on best practices. With this increase in technical capacity, China now has the largest number of coal mine methane capture and use projects in the world. In 2018, India set a goal to build 5,000 biogas plants by 2023. These are plants that capture the waste from anaerobic digesters used to process organic waste such as manure. To achieve this goal, India needed a systematic framework for tracking commissioned biogas projects and a process for evaluating projects. With EPA assistance, the government of India developed a framework for a national database of biogas project opportunities. And these were based on EPA's AgStar Livestock Anaerobic Digester Database. The government collected database in three states, and we understand that they are interested in expanding it nationally. With the database, and a checklist that EPA developed to evaluate the viability of potential projects, India is better equipped to standardize basic data collection across project sites, identify the most promising projects, track greenhouse gas emissions reductions, feedstocks and outputs, and link to national greenhouse gas inventory and mitigation goals. One of Mexico's objectives when it joined the Global Methane Initiative was to increase understanding of quantifying and reducing 
oil and gas methane emissions. Between 2006 and 2018, EPA worked closely with Mexico to develop a robust process for measuring and mitigating oil and gas methane emissions, including numerous technical trainings and measurement studies. Mexico and its national oil company Pemex have emerged as leaders on methane mitigation in the oil and gas sector. And in 2017, Mexico issued regulations to control oil and gas methane emissions. Now, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the Global Methane Initiative and all of its partner countries on its recent rechartering for another 10, 10 years. This rechartering and renewal of our commitment to take action on methane could not come at a better time. EPA has been proud to support the work of GM, GMI since its inception, serving as the host of the GMI Secretariat, serving in leadership roles and providing technical expertise that is the foundation of GMI's work. We look forward to continuing our longstanding support for GMI and to do so with our partners. In fact, I want to thank our international partners for all their actions to reduce methane and to support the Global Methane Initiative. And specifically, I do want to thank the Government of Canada for their leadership of GMI as the co-chair of the steering committee for the past several years. Thanks to your strong engagement and active leadership, GMI hosted a very successful Global Methane Forum event in Toronto and have made great progress in our collaborative efforts across multiple sectors. Several of GMI's strategic partners are also doing excellent work and important work to mitigate, to mitigate methane internationally. I feel I must cite several of them and the examples of leadership they have provided. The Climate and Clean Air Coalition has been successful in raising global awareness of methane as a short-lived climate pollutant and has developed an international partnership to better track methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. In addition to their work on municipal solid waste sector and in doing so in working cities, among other efforts. The United Nations Economic Commission of Europe developed first of its kind best practices for managing methane from coal mines and oil and gas operations. The International Energy Agency has increased global understanding of the linkage between energy systems and methane emissions. The World Bank has developed and demonstrated an innovative auction financing mechanism to incentivize methane recovery from landfills that has reduced millions of metric tons of methane globally. We applaud the successful efforts of all of our GMI partners to raise global awareness about methane emissions and mitigation opportunities, to track methane emission sources more effectively, and to incentivize methane mitigation globally. We look forward to working with our partners to reduce methane through the GMI partnership over the next 10 years. And yet much more work remains to be done. We must redouble our collective efforts. Temperatures and methane levels in the atmosphere continue to rise. The time to act is now, and we must collaborate to meet the global climate challenges. Together, we can raise awareness about methane's important role in climate change. And most importantly, together we can take action to reduce methane emissions. Responding to this call to action is an important way to support our commitments under the Paris Agreement. It is also a pathway to ensuring a better future for our children and grandchildren. And with that, I would like to thank the GMI and thank you all very much for our current and ongoing and hopefully fruitful partnership.
Thank you, Joseph, for those well um, thought out remarks. And, uh, and I'm so pleased to see um, the US back in stride and taking such a prominent role. All together, we can make great progress. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Mathilde Worstefer, Director of Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the Ener International Energy Agency. McTilde plans and coordinates the IEA work on energy sustainability, including clean energy technology and climate change policy. Previously, she held several senior management positions in the European Commission in the area of clean energy and was involved with the IEA for a number of years as the governing board representative for the European Union. We are very pleased that McTilde has agreed to provide us with the IEA's perspective on the benefits and challenges of methane mitigation. Thank you once again. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Now I turn it over to McTilde and we'll see if the technology works for us. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join the distinguished event and to share some thoughts from IEA on a crucial topic. The International Energy Agency very much welcomes the call for action on methane. And uh, my special thanks goes to the Global Methane Initiative, GMI, and this possibility to speak to you today. Methane emissions do not always get the attention that they deserve in the discussion on climate change. But let there be no mistake, methane makes a major contribution to global warming. And early action on methane emissions will be critical for avoiding the worst effects of climate change alongside action on carbon dioxide. There's never been a greater sense of urgency about this issue than there is today. At IEA, for many years, we have been highlighting the importance of reducing methane emission alongside action on CO2. In the brief presentation today, I'd like to focus on a few recent outputs from our side. First, the latest update on the IEA Methane Tracker 2021, where we provide the best estimates by country for oil and gas methane emission in 2020. We also published a regulatory roadmap and toolkit, which is a detailed how to go guide for policymakers and regulators seeking to cut methane emissions. Last but not least, we launched on the 18th of May, the IA, the new global roadmap to net zero by 2050. And that requires a concerted global effort to bring down methane emission over the coming decade. The concentration of methane in the atmosphere is now around two and a half greater than it was in pre-industrial times. This increase in methane concentrations is very worrying. Once released, methane doesn't stay around for long in the atmosphere, around 12 years compared with centuries for CO2. But it's a much more potent greenhouse gas. As you can see here from the slide, the largest source of human caused methane emission is agriculture, responsible for around one quarter of emissions directly followed by the energy sector. It is important to reduce all sources of emissions arising from human activity. The recent global methane assessment by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and UNEP shows that reducing human-made methane emissions by 45% this decade could avoid nearly 0.3 degrees of warming by 2035. This is a price well worth pursuing. At the IEA, we focus in particular on oil and gas methane emissions because of the huge scope to reduce them cost effectively. So how do we deal with methane in our new roadmap on net zero by 2050? The first thing to emphasize is that methane is an integral part of this roadmap alongside actions on CO2. Action on methane is not a choice, it's a necessity if we are to avoid severe impacts from climate change. 
Methane constitutes about 60% of emissions from the coal and natural gas supply chains and about 35 of emissions from the oil supply chain. In the new net zero by 2050 scenario, total methane emissions from fossil fuel fall by around 75 percent between 2020 and 2030. There are different ways to convert methane to CO2, but that's roughly equivalent to a 2.5 gigaton reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. To put it in another way, this is a reduction the same size as all energy related emissions from the European Union today. Around one third of this decline is a result of an overall reduction in fossil fuel consumption. But the larger share comes from a huge increase in the deployment of emission reduction measures and technologies, which leads to the elimination of all technically avoidable methane emissions by 2030. Our estimates suggest that there was a small downturn in global emission in 2020. A crucial task now for the oil and gas industry is to make sure that there is no rebound and that 2019 becomes the peak year for oil and gas methane emissions. There's a large variation in performance across country and companies. What you're looking at here at the slide, the emissions for each country, but also with the yellow dots, the methane intensity of oil and gas production. That is our estimate of the amount leaked for every unit of production. And the striking thing from our data is that the difference in, in intensity varies by a factor of more than 100. The worst are more than 100 times worse than the best. There is a depressing message, but in some ways it's also an encouraging one. Depressing because it shows the needless waste and damage that we are doing today. Encouraging because it underlies that for many countries, huge and rapid improvements in performance should be possible. Furthermore, addressing methane from oil and gas operations is not necessarily costly or technologically challenging. The methane tracker indicates that about 70% of these emissions can be abated with existing technology and a good part of this can come at no net cost because the value of the additional gas is less than the cost of the abatement measure. This can be done with relatively simple measures such as leak detection and repair programs. New sources of data are also becoming available, especially from aerial and satellite observation. Our latest update incorporated satellite readings for the first time. And I think we are rather proud to be able to show on a map like that what we are getting out of the satellite data. Overall, for 2020, this data accounted for some 5.5 million tons of methane emissions. This is less than 10% of the total volumes that we estimate are being emitted from oil and gas operations. For the moment, only the larger plums or super emitters are visible from space. There are lots of other emissions in these countries in addition to these that we include in the IEA methane tracker. These leaks might not last for long, but while they emit, they are very damaging. To put them in context, a flow rate of 20 tons per hour, which is the smallest dot that is shown here on the map, is equivalent to emissions from a 600 megawatt coal-fired power plant. Existing satellite coverage has limitations. It does not provide reliable measurements over equational region. Northern areas of offshore operation are not there. However, this is a very dynamic area and we see already improvements. I would like to emphasize that the focus of the IA is just not on defining problems, but finding solutions. In particular, solutions that governments can implement. And that brings me to our how-to guide that governments and regulators can use to bring down methane emissions from oil and gas operations. 
We believe that industry must act to reduce these emissions, but also that there is a strong role for government policies to incentivize early action by companies, push for transparency and improvements in performance, and support innovation in getting results. However, over the last few years, in our discussions with countries around the world, we heard a consistent theme. Countries would tell us that they understand the importance of acting to reduce methane emissions, but also that they lack some of the information and the tools that they need. In particular, they lack information on what other countries are doing, what their options are. That's why we chose to put together the new IEA regulatory roadmap. Over the last year, we looked at all around the world for examples of how countries, states and provinces have tackled this issue. We collected examples of regulation from more than 50 jurisdictions from the United States to Iraq and Nigeria, from Mexico to China. We are making all of this information freely available and accessible in our IEA policies database. And we use this information to build up our step-by-step -step guide for anyone trying, developing, or to update regulation on methane. There is no single solution that will work for everyone. So we have not attempted to come up with one, but we discuss the advantages and disadvantages of different approaches using examples and case studies. These include prescriptive or command and control requirements, performance-based requirements, economic instruments, and information-based instruments. In doing so, we provide policymakers with the tools that they need to take actions. Let me conclude. A key finding from our analysis is that effective policy tools already exist and can be implemented now, even without accurate baseline data on emissions. Better information can enable more efficient regulations, including performance and market-based instruments. However, requirements such as lead detection and repair programs and equipment mandates can be implemented without such data and can be an effective and powerful first step. Over time, jurisdictions may improve or supplement these requirements as more robust measurements and reporting regimes are put in place. At the IA, we look forward to the opportunity to continue work with a wide range of stakeholders, including, of course, the Global Methane Initiative to secure early and rapid reductions in these emissions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you once again to Mathilde for providing the International Energy Agency's perspective. Next, I'm really pleased to welcome Olga Algayerova, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. <clears throat> she was previously served as permanent representative of Slovakia to the International Organization in Vienna and State Secretary in Slovakia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She brings a strong focus on building and nurturing partnerships among key stakeholders with the UNECE. Olga, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the Global Methane Initiative for inviting me to join this international dialogue on a call for action on methane. We have worked together for many years with GMI and GMI's partners on methane and related topics. Our collaboration has been most notable in coal mining, 
Since 2004, we have developed various best practice guidance documents regarding methane, and we have conducted joint sessions and joint activities. More recently, we developed an overview of best practices for methane management in the oil and gas sectors. We appreciate that collaboration and we look forward to strengthening it in the, in the future. I congratulate GMI on the renewal of its charter for 10 years. Methane is an urgent problem that requires all of the above solutions with all of us, UNEC, GMI, and the full slate of stakeholders working together. Unfortunately, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were obliged to delay the 2020 Global Methane Forum. Given positive developments on COVID, we anticipate holding the forum in Geneva in 2022. GMI's call for action is very well timed. Our commission met in April. Our member countries recognize that early action at scale is needed on methane, CO2 and hydrogen and tasked our committee on sustainable energy to develop needed normative instruments. Commission also asked the committee for a broad appraisal of subsidies and carbon pricing. Furthermore, this September, the UN Secretary General will convene a high level dialogue on the energy related goals of the 2030 agenda, including an action plan for sustainable energy. Our committee on sustainable energy will meet following that dialogue. For its 30th anniversary session, countries will be asked to deliver near-term re results at scale through what we call the commitment trifecta. First, to achieve superior performance in buildings. Second, address growing concentrations of methane in the atmosphere. And third, modernize resource management. Bold action on those three areas will deliver real near-term outcomes and achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Climate Agreement. Longer-term actions outlined at the committee will explore delivering carbon neutrality, ensuring a just transition and preparing a hydrogen economy. Finally, at COP26, we will try urgently to find ways to limit global warming while delivering quality of life sustainably. Last week's WMO report stated that average global temperatures will have risen 1.5 degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels within five years. Our analysis show that the world is on the pathway to four to six degrees Celsius increase. Everything climate related is happening faster and with greater consequences. I used to say we were at 10 past midnight on the climate doomsday clock. I'm afraid I'm a, I may have been too optimistic. We must act fast with real impact and at scale. Which brings me to the call for action on methane. UNEC endorses and supports that call without hesitation. I would also ask countries to support a declaration by the UN General Assembly of an international decade for methane management in order to focus attention on a major area of concern but also a major area of opportunity. Reducing methane emissions offers significant climate benefits, especially near term, as there is potential for large reductions and cost effective mitigation technologies are readily available. Managing methane delivers important improvements in air quality and safety. It can also enhance the uptake of sustainable hydrogen and support a just transition. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas with 
120 times the climate forcing effect of CO2. As methane is a short-lived climate pollutant, there are debates whether methane's global warming effect should consider a 100-year or 20-year time frame. The issue is the CO2 equivalence used for methane. Does it have an 86 or 34 times greater warming effect than CO2? In our view, what matters is the total portfolio of methane molecules in the atmosphere, not the atmospheric residence time of individual molecules. Global atmospheric concentrations of methane have grown 150% from pre-industrial levels. We should be using the 120 instantaneous figure in our considerations. Applying a real carbon price of $120 or higher for CO2, you see immediately the economic implications of the choice of global warming potential. And again, we must act fast with real impact and at scale. Global emissions from human activity are projected to increase another 20% by 2030. Along with natural resources of methane, it begins to look like we may have passed a tipping point. It's imperative that we retreat from that precipice. Achieving a 50% reduction in methane emissions by 2050 would reduce global temperatures by 0.55 degrees Celsius. Methane is also a precursor to ozone and air pollution. It's emitted from three main sectors, fossil fuels, waste, including solid waste and wastewater, and agriculture, including rice paddies, enteric fermentation and manure. There is growing demand for natural gas, but that growth is at risk given that methane and CO2 emissions. Proper emissions management would bring substantial near-term climate and economic benefits and would reinforce the sustainability credentials of natural gas. Natural gas has an important role to play both as transition fuel, as the wood decarbonizes, and possibly also as a destination fuel if its environmental footprint can be attenuated. The existing infrastructure of natural gas will also be important as a career of renewable gases. The role of natural gas will depend on its economics, its environmental performance, and on the social angle, what we call a just transition. It will also depend on politics. Often, the natural gas industry touts its environmental performance vis-a-vis -vis coal, for countries that use coal today, turning their backs on coal risks creating disadvantaged communities as entire urban and industrial ecosystems developed around that primary fuel. That social risk represents a major obstacle for governments wanting to act. Enabling a just transition will enable stronger action. There is a well-known phrase, all roads lead to Rome. We have been exploring possible pathways to sustainable energy for our member states, and it's patently obvious that there is no one single such path. Each country has its own endowment of natural resources and its own cultural, legal and regulatory heritage. Each country will necessarily choose the pathway that best suits its needs. Our challenge is an international community is to get alignment of those interests with the objectives of the 2030 Agenda. We can start by using the common threads among the pathways to sustainability as a point of departure. As I noted, 
UNEC has been working for years on best practices on methane management in the coal industry in collaboration with all relevant stakeholders. We began with best practice guidance on coal mine methane, which was extended and strengthened over the years. Recognizing that methane emissions continue long after a mine has been shut, we also recently published best practice guidance for abandoned coal mines. Furthermore, we have developed a review of best practices in the oil and gas sector. To broaden our perspective, we think that the work on normative instruments in the fossils sector needs to cover monitoring, reporting and verification, as well as remediation for upstream oil and gas, downstream oil, downstream gas and coal. It is in light of this work that we are pushing for declaration of an international decade for methane management. The objectives of such a declaration would be to raise awareness among governments and industry of challenges and opportunities and to obtain stronger commitments to action. If we are successful with such a decade, the critical outcome would be declining atmospheric methane concentrations or at least declining emissions of methane from human activities. We would seek to develop detailed best practice guidance for all sectors, not just energy. An example would be development of standards for coal mine closure, including socioeconomic and environmental aspects delivering on a just transition. Another outcome would, we would expect to see is enduring programs and structures to disseminate, demonstrate and deploy relevant normative instruments with training, regulation and outreach to enhance their uptake. We would also propose that the international decade for methane management take a much broader view of the challenge, for example, through policies and standards for introducing renewable gases, including hydrogen, to reduce the carbon footprint of natural gas. We have been in discussion for some time with our partners on the idea of a UN General Assembly declaration of an international decade for methane management. This would be a vehicle for raising awareness and coordinating among the range of existing initiatives. It represents a push to get country commitments and real action. Ladies and gentlemen, we are cooking our planet and can witness multipliers of the climate change threat in action. Addressing methane emissions is one of few actions that can have real impact at scale relatively quickly. I would ask countries to include stronger action on methane in their climate negotiations and in their commitments at the high level dialogue on energy in September. The success of an international decade for methane management will depend on strong country support. Hence my call for wide endorsement, support and championing of the initiative. We have no time to wait. We must act fast, with real impact and at scale. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, for that uh, insightful and inspirational comments. And thank you for highlighting the opportunities for global action through a potential international decade of methane management and the work that your organization has already done to advance this. For our next keynote address, I would like to introduce Fred Krupp, president of the Environmental Defense Fund, to speak to the importance of action on methane. Fred has guided the EDF for three decades, overseeing its growth from a small nonprofit to one of the world's most influential environmental organizations with more than 750 employees and an annual budget of more than 200 million. Fred is a leading voice on climate change, energy, and corporate sustainability. 
He was named one of America's best leaders by US News and World Report and received the 2015 William K. Riley Environmental Leadership Award from the Center for Environmental Policy at American University. He and Miriam Horn co-authored the New York Times bestseller, Earth, the sequel, The Race to Reinvent Energy and Stop Global Warming. We're very pleased that Fred has agreed to share with us some of his perspectives on the importance of action on methane. Thank you. If you take one thing away from my talk today, remember this. The single most impactful action we can take to slow global warming is to slash methane pollution now. So let me explain why that is, some of the work underway, and also outline the steps we need to take to lower temperatures we would otherwise see as well as the ferocity of future storms. First, the importance of methane. The Global Methane Assessment just out from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the UN Environment Program concludes that lowering methane emissions is the key to preventing catastrophic climate change. Our next speaker, Drew Schindel, lead author of the report, will detail those conclusions. Inger Anderson, Executive Director of UNEP, of course, said, and I quote, cutting methane is the strongest lever we have to slow climate change over the next 25 years and complements necessary efforts to reduce carbon dioxide. Now, EDF scientists agree and also see this as a tremendous opportunity. A paper published just last month led by Dr. Alyssa Akko found that a rapid full-scale effort to cut methane pollution from oil and gas, large-scale agriculture, and other major human activities could slow the rate of warming by as much as 30%. Think about what that would mean compared to inaction. Less ferocious storms, less heat waves, less flooding, less melting of ice in the tundra. There is simply no better opportunity to reduce radiative forcing and all manner of catastrophic impacts in our lifetime. Methane reductions are a key part of the net zero carbon scenario released by the International Agen Energy Agency a couple of weeks ago. Props to the Global Methane Initiative, one of the first initiatives set up to address this challenge starting more than a decade ago. Around that time, EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, organized a six-year series of 16 studies involving 150 researchers documenting methane pollution across the oil and gas supply chain in the United States. A synthesis of those studies in 2018 found that pollution was 60% higher than the official EPA inventory at that time. Recently, the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, reported that methane levels are now uh, in the atmosphere are now the highest on record. To convert this problem into an opportunity, we need one government action, two industry action, and three accountability for both. Let's start with government action. In the U.S., our new president understands the impact of methane. On his very first day in office, President Biden signed an order to restore and expand methane standards for the oil and gas industry, which the prior administration had tried to revoke. The U.S. Senate recently voted to speed up the process of putting in place stronger rules by repealing the Trump rules. Our House of Representatives is expected to follow suit soon. Getting stronger rules is a top priority in the United States. One step we believe the administration can take next, re-engage with Canada and Mexico around our 2016 agreement to cut methane pollution in North America by 40 to 45% by 2025 and raise that bar to a 75% reduction by 2030. 
by 2030. We're also encouraged by the U.S. administration's launch of the Net Zero Producers Forum, and we would expect to see methane reduction as its first priority. Meanwhile, the European Union announced a new methane strategy last fall, a big step. By the end of this year, we hope to see strong rules for leak detection and repair and to reduce venting and flaring of methane in Europe. And Europe can do more. As the world's largest gas importer, importing 85% of its natural gas, Europe has the power to set standards requiring that the gas they use is produced cleanly no matter where in the world it's produced. Methane pollution from that gas used in Europe is currently estimated to be three to eight times higher in the supplier countries than the gas supply chain inside the EU. A methane performance standard for all gas sold in the EU would have a broad effect on gas suppliers worldwide, both an opportunity for the EU, EU and a responsibility. We'd like to see the EU propose a standard by the end of the year. China, Japan, and South Korea could all do the same, putting standards on imported gas. China is making progress on methane. In December, President Xi announced plans to peak CO2 emissions before 2030 and explicitly included methane. In March, the 14th five-year plan called out stronger controls on methane and other non-carbon dioxide greenhouse gases. And two weeks ago, seven Chinese oil and gas companies pledged to reduce methane intensity to below 0.25% of production by 2025, in line with pledges from other leading global producers. Even Russia, the largest natural gas exporter, is signaling concern. At the White House summit in April, President Putin talked about methane and called for cooperation to reduce emissions. Action by governments is certainly a big reason for growing concern by the oil and gas industry and its investors. Today, oil and gas producers are directly competing with cleaner renewable energy sources. Just last week, ExxonMobil shareholders concerned about the company's slow response to this challenge voted out two of the company's directors. The same day, 61% of Chevron shareholders voted for a resolution to cut carbon emissions from its company's products. Environmental risk is now recognized as a business risk. Failure carries a high price. For example, last fall, the biggest gas utility in France canceled a $7 billion deal to buy liquid natural gas produced in Texas over concern about methane and other pollution. One reason dissonant Exxon shareholders succeeded last week is because major Wall Street investors joined with big retirement funds to support the move. It's an issue of financial returns, of course, but many of these investors are demanding accountability. A few weeks ago, J.P. Morgan Chase, the largest oil and gas lender in the world, announced a set of 2030 climate targets for oil and gas, electric power, and transportation. It entails a 75% reduction in methane emissions from oil and gas in its portfolio, a 90% cut in flaring. We've also seen global oil and gas companies come out in support of stronger methane standards in both the EU and the US. That's encouraging. We've also seen them setting voluntary commitments. In 2018, 13 companies in the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative pledged to reduce average emissions intensity from upstream operations to 0.25% with ambitions to achieve 0.2%. We can't overlook the oil and gas methane partnership, another important initiative by the uh, CCAC and UNEP, along with the European Commission and the Environmental Defense Fund. The oil and gas methane partnership includes 64 companies with assets on five continents, representing 30% of the world's oil and gas production. 
it creates a rigorous objective framework for methane accounting that makes it easier for public officials, investors, and the public to track and compare performance across companies. The goal is a 45% reduction in the industry's methane emissions by 2025 and a 60 to 75% reduction by 2030. New OGMP 2.0 standards announced last November set a new bar by requiring real measurements instead of engineering estimates. They'll also be the basis for the new EU methane standards and the framework for reporting under a European performance standard. Crucially, the Oil and Gas Methane Partnership 2.0 includes not only a company's own operation, but also the many joint ventures responsible for a substantial share of global oil and gas production. All of these commitments are important, but for the most part, they're still just promises. It's a long way to get from good intentions to real result, and we can't afford to go slowly, which brings us to accountability. Now that they're finally talking the talk, we need to hold these institutions to their commitments, government and industry both. It's one of the most important things we need to do right now. People have learned to say the right things. Now we need to make sure they do the right things. I believe that accountability starts with data. We need robust, reliable, and, and organized accounting of emissions by company, by country, and on a global scale. Emissions data needs to be public. So all of us, stakeholders, competitors, the public, can see who is and who isn't getting the job done. Which brings me to another effort I want to applaud today, the International Methane Emissions Observatory, once again organized by UNEP and the European Commission. This observatory called AMIO will be the key to accountability and action on methane. And MIO will be an aggregator and validator for the vast stream of methane data already being generated by government, industry, scientists, and civil society. It will make available trustworthy data. People can debate methane, methane policies, but we shouldn't have to argue about methane facts. EMEO will collate emissions data collected through the OGMP, reporting aggregate company data and verifying progress on targets. EMEO will work with governments to develop policy relevant science and sharpen understanding of the importance of methane to achieving the Paris Agreement targets. EMEO will improve the transparency, visibility, and consistency of emissions data from all sources, including a growing number of methane detecting satellites. Integrating satellite data is particularly important. In the past few years, we've seen new orbital sensors launched. First was TROPOMI, operated by the European Space Agency. And now we're seeing a whole new generation of satellites emerge with an expanding array of capabilities. One of these is MethaneSat, which is being developed by my organization, the Environmental Defense Fund. MethaneSat will be able to detect and quantify methane almost anywhere on Earth at concentrations as small as three parts per billion. Under construction right now in Colorado, MethaneSat is scheduled to be ready for launch in October of next year. It's designed to both accelerate and motivate methane reductions accelerate by giving operators and regulators new ability to locate and quantify total emissions with frequent high precision measurements worldwide. Motivated, motivate by making the data public in near real time so that anybody can see how much methane is coming from where and who's responsible for it. And they can also see who is best at cleaning up. Because of its high sensitivity, MethaneSat will measure the pollution that other satellites just can't see, quantifying total pollution from all sources, big and small, is key to assessing progress. Think of those gathering lines spanning vast terrain in the Permian. With a lot of little leaks, 
they will be visible to methane satellite. Together, the data from satellites, aircraft, drones, and ground-based measurements have the potential to unlock a tremendous climate opportunity. Let me end with something I mentioned earlier. Imagine if we had actually managed to slow the rate of warming by 30%. That's huge all by itself. But that paper by Dr. Akko also says that by fully deploying known solutions to reduce this pollution from all the major sectors, we could cut methane from human sources in half by 2030. That would avoid a quarter of a degree Celsius, half a degree Fahrenheit of additional global mean warming by mid-century and more than half a degree C or one degree Fahrenheit by 2100. That half degree would make a critical difference in a world we're trying to limit global warming. It could mean 10 million people fewer, 10 million fewer at risk from sea level rise, half as many people stressed for water, half as many plant and animal species losing crucial habitat. How close we get to realizing this potential is up to us. This is the methane challenge today. This is the opportunity we have to make a tremendous difference right now in our lifetime. Many of you listening today are in a position to make a difference, and I urge you to help. Thank you. Thank you to Fred for underscoring the urgency and importance of action to mitigate methane emissions. The challenge is real. For our last keynote, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Drew Schindel, Chair of the Scientific Advisory Panel of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and Professor of Climate Science at Duke University. His research group is particularly focused on quantifying the impacts on human health agricultural yields, climate, and the economy of policies that might be put in place to mitigate climate change or improved air quality. He's been an author of more than 275 peer-reviewed publications. That's quite an impressive number. He's received awards from Scientific American, NASA, the National Science Foundation, and, um, and the EPA and is an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union and American Association for the Advancement of Science. He most recently chaired the 2021 Global Methane Assessment and has kindly agreed to speak to us about it today. Drew, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helen. And thank you all for coming out to listen. Um, not that you're necessarily out very far, but I did want to talk to you about the benefits and costs of methane mitigation, which is the subtitle of our global methane assessment. It's everybody else. I, I thank all of the speakers who went before because they have done a, a great job of already covering many of the main conclusions. But I, I do want to want to talk to you about a few of the things we found that are really relevant to the GMIs very laudable call to action on methane. If I could have the next slide, please. One of the things that we already heard about is how we have a lot of, of talk and a lot of work on methane, and yet we're still going in the wrong direction. And as was alluded to, the most recent data from last year showed that not only are we at record levels of methane, but the rate at which methane grew last year was the fastest in the entire record. So we are going rapidly up when we need to be going rapidly down. Now this is in part due to in increased use of fossil fuels, uh, the surge in, in fracking and switch from coal to gas, in part due to biogenic fluxes from wetlands in the tropics, and some of that may be driven by climate. Uh, these kind of so issues are very interesting scientifically, but they don't affect our policy going forward. We know we can't, the only way to deal with biogenic emissions from say tropical wetlands or thawing permafrost increasing is to slow the rate of climate change. And the way to do that is to target the anthropogenic ones. So what we need in the assessment concludes what you can see on a graph from the right is really a U-turn. Instead of going up rapidly, 
we need methane to be going down rapidly. And to be on the 1.5 degree path, we need a cut of around 45% by the end of this decade. So that really goes to what we heard before from UNECE about a, a decade for international action on methane to reach this target. Next, please. We also have looked in the past at what we can get from controlling fossil fuels and just phasing out fossil fuels without a real targeted effort to control methane. And what you can see here is that when you get rid of fossil fuels, the sulfur comes along with the burning of coal primarily. And so the net impact over, you know, this was a phase out starting in 2020, the net impact over those subsequent 30 years is on average essentially zero. So we have no time to lose in starting to, to um, make dr dramatic efforts and really aggressive efforts to reduce CO2 because it's so long lived. We have to start now in order to have a better planet by the end of the century. But at the same time, starting now doesn't buy us relief in the near term. We get virtually no relief from the increase in storms, the increase in heat waves, droughts, etc. All of these things that are happening now, we don't get any relief from those in the next 30 years. The next slide, please. In contrast, when we compare with what happens when we reduce methane, there I've put the results from the global methane assessment over this, this graph from an earlier publication. And you can see that you really do bend the curve of warming in the near term. So methane is a complement to reducing CO2. Reducing CO2 is vital for the long-term welfare of, of our planet, but reducing methane, I would argue, is also vital, and it's vital for the near term because that matters too. People are alive today and suffering from the consequences of climate change, and waiting to, to do something about that till the latter half of the century will bring uh, no real relief to all the people suffering the consequences already. The next slide, please. So in the assessment, we really tried to take a comprehensive view of all of the consequences for society that we were able to quantify by making the kind of reductions we need to get to 1.5. So we have present day emissions is that first bar on the left. In 2030, our current trajectory will take us higher, right? We are still going up despite all of the, the wonderful work being done. It is not sufficient as of yet to have changed the trajectory. So we documented how controls could be put in place targeting methane in the agriculture sector. That's that first bar, which brings us from above 400 million tons a year down to a bit below. The waste sector, you can take another big bite out of the, the emissions. The fossil fuel sector gives us the biggest reduction through targeted controls. And then we have a category we call additional. And these are things that are not focused on methane, but also reduce methane as a byproduct of their, their primary goals. So examples would be shifting from fossil fuels to renewables, which is primarily a measure that one would take to deal with CO2 emissions. But of course, you know, it, it's not uh, sufficient to get rid of methane from things like abandoned oil wells and abandoned mines, but of course it reduces leaks from methane systems if you are using less natural gas as a fuel. Another example would be reductions in food waste, which is generally done for the sake of food security. Another would be healthy diets, which are done precisely as the name suggests, because they improve public health. Uh, all of these have the potential to reduce methane emissions, um, but we call, a, call those additional measures. When you put them all together, you can get methane down to that 45% reduction, which gets you nicely in the range across all of the 1.5 degree scenarios as assessed by the IPCC. And you get this avoided warming of around three tenths of a degree by the 2040s. That's pretty profound. 
um, again, if you especially if you keep in mind the previous chart, which showed how how little you could get by uh, most of the other options we have on the table for the near term. Remember that the phase out of fossil fuels would essentially get you zero by this time period, although it's obviously critical for the longer term. And then the nice thing about methane, as we've heard a little before, is that you get a, a lot of additional benefits as well. So it's not just the avoided climate change, but it's also the reduction in ground level ozone. And so we quantify the avoided deaths related to ozone, which exacerbates respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, around a quarter of a million fewer deaths per year by the end of this decade when these reductions are in place. So they, they, while the climate effects, climate benefits rather of methane reductions are very rapid compared to, to reducing other greenhouse gases, the health effects are virtually instantaneous. That in addition to the avoided deaths, there's around three quarter of a million avoided emergency room visits for asthma. There's around 25 million of tons of crop loss avoided. That one's interesting in that it's a function of both the ozone exposure, which is not good for crops, same way it's not good for people, but it's also a function of climate change. And the latter there, lost work hours, is from the reduced uh, heat waves and heat stress that exposes workers, especially in construction, agriculture, and mining. If I could have the next slide, please. So if you have all of these benefits, then we, we quantify as well all of the individual measures and what their potential is, looking at analyses produced by groups like the IEA that we've heard from and the EPA. And we find that there's the greatest potential in the fossil fuel sector, but there's also a need for substantial, although smaller reductions in the other two main sectors, waste and agriculture. So we have individual targets for the different sectors. If I could have the next slide, please. One of the most positive or optimistic signs across all of this, I think, is that if we look at the same kind of chart that I showed before, instead of sorting by what sector the measures are put into place, we sort by how much they cost. We find that the majority of the measures are not very expensive. There's a large chunk that pay for themselves, the kind of thing we've heard about, especially in the fossil fuel sector. There are also a lot that are low cost, and there's only a few that are, that are fairly expensive. So the, the financial uh, incentives are really encouraging for reducing methane. If I could have the next slide, please. We go through some, some detail, and I'm really showing this just so you know that it's there in the assessment. I'm not gonna go through all these, what the top, the targeted measures that focused on methane are. Uh, these are all things that are already in use. And so we're just calling for best practices to be adopted around the world in those places where they're not. If I could have the next slide, please. And just to give you a little more information on what the additional measures are, these are not always things that are in use, but as I mentioned before, there are things like uh, energy efficiency, demand management. There's also consumer behavior that changes the waste stream and changes waste separation, in particular getting organics out of the waste stream and reducing waste itself, as well as adopting healthier diets. Now, the last thing I wanted to show to you, if I could have the next slide, please, is that we've also built a web tool and you can find this online. The address is there, but you can search for it if you don't have time to write it down. And what you can do is this will allow you to look at the mitigation potential in any sector, to sort by cost, to sort by region of the world, to find what's available. In this example, it's fossil fuels, available at low cost worldwide. It's about 37 million tons, and then it gives you the benefits. You can choose which benefits you want to look at, and you can put your cursor over the country you're interested in. Here I put it over India in the right, and I can see the number pops up. It gives me at the bottom the average cost for these fossil fuel measures is minus $851 a ton. So they, they make you money rather than costing you, and the total benefit to society is, a, is over $4,000 a ton. So it's to really make the argument and to, to buttress argument, provide national level data supporting how 
these measures pay for themselves, especially if you account for the environmental benefits, but often, as in this example, even if you don't. If I could have the last slide, please, to conclude. I wanted to just reiterate a couple of things I already said. Methane mitigation is one of the most significant actions we can take this decade, so it's vitally important that we increase our ambition. I would wholeheartedly support the call to action from GMI, as well as the UNECE's call for an international decade of effort to reduce methane. In part, I think we have a good chance of success because so many of the reductions can be made at low or negative costs. And I think it's very important that we, we reiterate and publicize that there are multiple benefits. It's not just that we, we make a dent in getting to the 1.5 degree pathway, but also there, there are feedbacks. There are climate tipping points. There's a loss of Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets. There's cumulative impacts like sea level rise. All of these things matter, um, are affected by the rate of warming in the next few decades and not just the long-term path. There's also the improved air quality and the millions of lives over many decades that can be saved. The improvement in food security by preventing crop losses due both to climate change and ozone. There's increasing carbon uptake by forests. I only showed how ozone affects crops, but it also affects the ability of agriculture to, sequ to sequester carbon. And there's job creation through these mitigation efforts. Things like plugging leaks takes a lot of person effort on the ground. Strong policies are needed to achieve the ambitious targets that we've outlined. So I'm looking forward to working with hopefully many of the people involved in this meeting today uh, to put such strong policies into place. Thank you very much for, for listening. The report, the assessment is online, and I hope you will turn there for additional information. Back to you, Helen. Thank you, Drew, for providing an overview of this impressive report. This timely work provides us with compelling science-based arguments for urgent action on methane. And I'm really pleased that you highlighted the important health benefits that can come from this, these actions. And I know this work will help draw more attention to the linkages between methane, ozone, and health impacts. Uh, I encourage all of our participants today to have a deeper look at the report and its findings as it will most certainly be a key resource as we move forward. We will now transition to our industry panel discussion and our Q's and A's, which will be moderated by Drew. So Drew, I'm gonna turn it back to you for the moderated session. Wonderful. Thank you, Helen. So I'm very much looking forward to a discussion and some, some Q and A, especially as we've, we've had a series of, of uh, keynote speak, speakers, which I have found very interesting, but I'm looking forward to this more interactive part. And I would like to begin by just introducing uh, the panelists who will be participating. We have Vicki Holub, who's President and Chief Executive Officer of, of Occidental Petroleum. And we have David Newman, President of the World Biogas Association. So some pretty uh, ob obviously relevant and, and timely industry input. And what we're going to do is we have a, a series of, of questions here, which we're going to attempt to have the panelists um, weigh in on in sometimes together, sometimes specifically directed to one or other. And we, we're hoping that we have managed to all of us work out the technical details for that. So we're going to start the, the, the overall arc, overarching idea is to see from the industry point of view, really how, how to follow up on everything that we've been hearing from these keynote presentations. There are these opportunities, uh, GMI is producing data, IEA is producing data, EPA, all of these groups. What, what does it take for industry to adopt the kind of recommendations and what are the considerations? So to begin this, the first question is that we, we know that the opportunities for 
carbon dioxide reductions often dominate in discussions on climate change. Uh, that makes a lot of sense and that CO2 is, is the most powerful of all of the greenhouse gases um, in terms of its total impact to date. So reductions in CO2 are indeed critical component, but methane plays an extremely important role as we've heard. What the question then is, what would be the most effective way to raise the profile of methane abatement as an essential part of the climate change mitigation strategy um, amongst decision makers? So I'm gonna ask, uh, Vicky, to, to go first, and then we'll we'll transition from there to David and get a, a response from each of you. Thank you, Drew. Uh, first, I'll say I'm happy to be here today. It's great to be a part of this, uh, this conference, and I think it's really, really important because this is the kind of thing that does help raise the awareness that methane is a very potent pollutant that we definitely need to focus on. And as a member of API, and uh, we we are actively involved in a voluntary partnership, and we're one of the first and founding members of that partnership to address methane emissions. And to us, it's it's time to now take advantage of all the amazing technologies that are being developed. Um, there was a time when we really couldn't tell, in some cases, where leaks were coming from. We now know that there are a lot of leak points within uh, the, the operations of our, um, our methane and the handling of methane. Uh, we are developing technologies that uh, not only measure that better um, in terms of its presence, but also its volume. And now we can start to target first the, the worst uh, parts and the, the most uh, strategic parts that we need to eliminate or reduce. And we're doing that in ways that uh, that are advancing faster than in the past, but not as fast as we need them to. For example, some of the things we're doing are building more like closed loop systems where we eliminate the leak points. So we're starting to design our facilities in a way that we reduce the points at which uh, methane can leak out of the um, out of the facilities. Those that we can eliminate, the facilities we can eliminate, we do have vapor recovery and other things that will take that gas that would otherwise get into the atmosphere that we can then direct into the closed loop system. We're also trying to give ourselves flexibility around uh, when a situation might occur where a third party processing plant or something might go down to more quickly be able to divert the gas uh, to an alternate facility or alternate system. Um, so those are some of the things around operations, but we've recently put together a team that's focused on emissions technology, and what they're trying to do is build what would be a next decade facility and try to get that designed today and try to start implementing um, a better way of getting the gas molecule from the reservoir to actually where it's used. And part of that process is um, is around the design of the equipment, but also uh, how we drill and how we complete our wells. And using green completions where we can capture the methane that would have otherwise been emitted at the way we used to do fracking and flowbacks, we can now capture that and get that into the system right away so that we've eliminated that that um, that point. And What's really driving us right now in terms of our sense of urgency is exactly what Drew said. It's time to take action now and not delay. So we uh, we were the first US oil and gas company to uh, commit to the World Bank that we would join their initiative to eliminate uh, routine flaring by 2030. And part of some of what I've talked about with respect to facility redesign and capturing uh, the emissions where you can't redesign it and then trying to ensure that you have flexibility and what to do with the gas when there's a disruption downstream. All of those things will play into enabling us to, to be able to achieve that zero routine flaring by 2030. And fortunately today, just as there are better technologies being developed to help um, target where the emission points are, there are better uh, valves being constructed today that that and flanges that don't have the leak points and that, that are eliminating 
those as potential leak points. So we are taking action. It's been um, something that we we feel needs to be accelerated. So we support um, greater uh, policies around how to measure and how to capture methane and how to reduce it over time. So we're aggressively working toward um, making um, our methane emissions much lower. We've committed to, as a member of OGCI, which is the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, we've committed to achieve an upstream methane intensity target of 0.2% uh, by 2025. And so that's uh, that's going to be quite a reduction from us, um, from our emission reductions. And the other member companies of OGCI have committed to the same. So I think it's a matter of making that commitment, advancing the technologies, and being committed to, to make it, making it happen as soon as you can. Thank you. That that is great to hear of what uh, what Occidental is is doing and how seriously you take this problem. And I'm sure we'll we'll have a little time to return to a couple of those things. I want to turn it over to David to make some entry re introductory remarks about the Biogas Association and and if you want to chime in on the effective way to to raise the profile as an essential part of the climate solution amongst decision makers. David? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm talking to you from London. And uh, thank you very much indeed to our friends at the GMI for this invitation. Um, and in my various <coughs> roles over the last 20 years, I've had long interactions with the GMI. And very good to see you guys back. We need you. Um, I'm coming at this uh, from a completely different uh, angle to that of Vicky because as our as our recent report, if you if you wish, I can show you some slides. Otherwise, I can use them later. Um, but as um, a, a recent report, which we published as an, an association, we showed that <clears throat> huge amounts of methane emissions are coming from uncontrolled dumping of biogenic wastes. Um, we have um, your speakers already talked about the science, but we have estimated that roughly about 100 billion tons of biogenic wastes are dumped into the environment every year, and we're only recovering some 2% of those. Um, and most of those biogenic wastes, if I can see the slide myself, I will remind myself of the data, um, you, you would think would be <clears throat> would be food waste, but actually they're not. There's 80% the of 60%, 70% is sewage sludge, of which 80% is returned to the environment untreated. Um, and uh, huge amounts of livestock manures and slurries, some 33 billion tons, crop residues, and of course food waste. Now, all of these materials are, <clears throat> as I say, going from um, mainly urban centres, city centres, uh, in an uncontrolled way into the environment. And simply putting biogas plants onto major sewage facilities is one way in which we can easily, cost effectively, and efficiently ca capture. Uh, methane. Um, and uh, as most of you are, are, are in North America, across North America, we are seeing huge uptake of biogas installations in some of the bigger uh, dairy and uh, livestock uh, farming uh, um, businesses, uh, where there are a lot of slurries that can be captured, uh, can be used to, to, the methane can be used then to generate either electricity or, or, or heating gas. Um, and and the uptake of these technologies across the globe is very, very rapid indeed. Um, so the message is, is getting out. Um, one thing that uh, we note, however, is that when we look at um, the commitments which countries have put into their uh, non uh, nationally determined contributions uh, under the climate change agreements is that we have um, very, very few definite um, commitments on bio waste management and on the use of that bio waste into uh, into biogas production. So one thing that we can do at a global level is to ensure that when the countries go to Glasgow uh, at this climate change meeting, and we are trying to do this, is that they are aware of the great potential which um, capturing those biogenic wastes, producing biogas from them, uh, can have to their climate abatement targets. We estimate, and, and <clears throat> you may all um, titter, but we estimate with, with the IEA that some 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions can be uh, saved, reduced uh, by using 
such technologies by capturing bio waste and by putting it through biogas installations. Well, I, for one, am not tittering. I'm very excited to hear th stories like that. And large potential is precisely why I think there's so much excitement about the possibility of, of stronger action on methane. So I want to follow up with you, David, and, and I, I'm very happy to hear about the rapid uptake at the at the larger farms and especially in pro probably the most advanced parts of the of the world. What what could you comment on the suitability and barriers to implementation of biogas projects for small scale agriculture? And in particular, it, it, it seems like as if there are small businesses who have solutions who can implement these in for farmers in developing countries, but it doesn't seem to be picking up quite as rapidly there. Is there a way for governments, global organizations and such to support small businesses on that? Well, you know, I, th I think there is a, a misconception here that actually uh, small scale biogas is growing very, very rapidly and small scale biogas installations are in the millions. I think we counted last year 32 million small scale biogas installations across the globe. And, and of course, uh, almost all in, in, in rapidly developing uh, economies, India, China, uh, Africa, Latin America. Uh, and we have done many webinars with the development uh, institutions, the development organizations who are pushing these small scale solutions. One little bit of information which, you know, might your, your audience might in, enjoy was uh, at, a, at a COP meeting a couple of years ago. Um, I gave, was giving a talk and a, and a delegation came up to me from the Sahel, from Chad, from Mali, um, from Burkina Faso. And uh, these countries are planting the Great Green Wall, the Great Green African Wall. You may have read about it. Um, it's, a, it's a barrier of trees across the south of the Sahara from the Atlantic Ocean through to the Red Sea, 6,000 kilometers of trees and green areas are being planted. Quite a phenomenal uh, activity. And they said to, to, to me, they said, Mr. Newman, you know, we, we love biogas because, you know, we get some energy from it. We can light our houses. Um, but above all, we love it for the wet slurry that it gives, which is helping us grow crops, helping us plant those trees, helping us green the Sahel. And I have to admit to you, I was, we have a phrase in English, I was gobsmacked uh, because um, you know, we, we think of these things in terms of energy, we think of these things in terms of methane abatement, but we actually don't think of these things sometimes as the side benefits, growing trees, who had thought? Um, and, and yet for them, that was the most important benefit of small scale biogas. Thank you. That is, that is an, indeed a, a very interesting story and an interesting application. I, I think that is one of the challenges that we've heard about from some of the keynote speakers as well. How do you convey the, the benefits of having compost as well as public health, as well as climate mitigation, etc.? cetera? Um, so very interesting to see which the different, different areas might focus on different impacts along this large stream of consequences from mitigation. I want to come back to to Vicky now and return to the oil and gas sector. And I, I have two questions for you or two related questions. One is to talk about and you've already talked about this a little bit. What are the greatest challenges and gaps that need to be addressed in oil and gas sector to meet the Paris Agreement? The other is I, I, if, you, if you're willing, I hope you don't mind, but yesterday there were stories in many of the major media outlets, um, including, for example, the New York Times ran a story about how some of the majors were doing great things and lowering their footprints, kind of like you had described. But in a couple examples, um, what they, some of the big companies had done was sell off some of their operations with the, the highest methane intensity to small operators. And therefore, I think the examples were BP and ConocoPhillips had dropped their carbon footprints, but the national emissions hadn't actually dropped at all. Um, if, if you're willing to comment on that too, is that something that we need to address? Is that one of the great challenges? And in general, what, what would you say are the greatest challenges for oil and gas? 
I, I'll address the second one first because I do have some passion around that one. And that is that it's critically important um, to to pay attention to what's happening to the oil and gas industry in the United States. Uh, now, I know part of those some of those transactions were in the United States, but I do believe that through peer pressure and through partnerships and through API's environmental partnership, I do believe there's a lot of commitment in the US oil and gas companies to advance our technologies to further reduce methane in our own operations. I do believe there's been a um, an awakening in our industry that's driving a lot of CEOs to be uh, very committed to making this happen. And as you know, a lot of the European companies have gone to uh, to renewables and some have even said they'll re right. reduce their oil and gas production and they'll go to renewable uh, production so that helps their company. We all as an industry, we must be conscious of the fact that if we are shifting production in the world to um, to scenarios where the methane emission is not going to be reduced, that is not something that's going to help our planet. And we've got to be very careful with that. I believe that um, and, and I trust that uh, President Biden and his administration will understand that we have a much better chance of controlling emissions in the United States than we do in some areas around the world. Now, I'll applaud uh, some areas in the Middle East are doing a great job, um, but there's just some parts of the world that aren't at the level we are and that don't have the methane emission requirements and regulations that the EPA is putting back in place, which we strongly endorse. So that has to happen. Simply shifting the production to someone else and not doing anything about it is not going to work. And so th that's the reason that we feel like we're perfectly positioned to be a leader in, um, in helping to reduce emissions over time because what we're doing is, uh, is not as broadly appreciated as I would like for it to be because I, I think uh, we're, we're stepping out and um, we're trying to get ahead of this because we are leveraging our core expertise. And again, I'm not saying that what the European companies are doing is wrong because we need more renewables. So they're going to be putting capital into renewables. But what we're doing is we're taking advantage of the, the, the large footprint that we have in the United States to leverage our CO2 enhanced oil recovery experience and therefore get more out of the reservoirs that exist today rather than needing to go develop um, new production in uh, areas that are more sensitive and that are more difficult to, to manage the emissions. And so what we believe is it's best to recover more from reservoirs that are already developed. And it's really important that, um, that you apply as much technology to those as you can. So um, we're not going to um, to go and develop renewables for distribution. We are going to use renewables in our operations because they're a part of our plan to reduce emissions. And we we were, um, we were installed what we believe was the first um, solar plant, 16 megawatt solar plant in, um, in the state of Texas that primarily was built to run oil and gas wells. And so that's what it's doing. We will build more solar, but it's to lower our footprint within our own operations. Uh, the thing that we're doing beyond that is we're going to use some technologies like direct air capture and, um, and carbon capture on uh, industrial sites to further lower our, our footprint. And what I think is a, is a big challenge for us to be able to communicate people and to help people understand is that the world is going to need oil and gas for decades to come. The transition is not going to be as short as some people believe. So within that transition, there has to be companies that are committed to doing more than just lowering our methane emissions. We have to do that, but we also need to help with the emissions from other industries. And so we've, we've signed up a couple of agreements to take uh, CO2, the CO2 emissions, and capture them from a couple of ethanol plants and a cement plant in, in southern Colorado and an LNG facility uh, that'll be built in Texas. And so 
getting that anthropogenic CO2, not letting it get into the atmosphere is one way we're trying to address our carbon footprint. The second way is to build a direct air capture facility, the largest one that, that will exist in the world in the Permian Basin. Uh, I think the, the other, the, the largest facility that exists today is cap capturing about 4,000 tons a year. Our facility will, will capture 1 million tons per year. And the gap that's that's right now I'm seeing in the um, in our ability to meet the Paris Accord is that not enough is being done to um, to capture CO2 before it gets into the atmosphere, and not enough is being done to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. The models show that a significant amount of this must be done, and so we're building the first large-scale commercial facility to do that, and we've got to have more of those built. It'll take a lot of those to offset the emissions of uh, of the aviation industry. I've I've quoted a, a number of about it take a, it would take about a thousand direct air capture facilities to offset about half of the aviation industry's emissions. So what what we need to communicate and help people understand is that to meet the goals of the Paris Accord, direct air capture has to happen. Carbon capture from industrial sites has to happen. So we need people to understand that the best way to make it commercial is to allow us to do what we do best, and that's putting the CO2 into existing reservoirs to increase the recovery from those reservoirs rather than having to develop in the future additional uh, oil and gas production to meet the world's needs in sensitive places. Well, thank you, and I, I'm glad you brought up too that different parts of the world still have very different performance standards and we saw that chart from IEA and I've, I've seen it repeatedly and every time I see it, it just astonishes me how, you know, a factor of a hundred difference and, and indeed some places doing much better uh, than others. So thank you for being willing to address that issue of, of the corporate sell-offs to other operators. Uh, it's very interesting to hear the, the work on carbon capture and storage and indeed that that is deployed in in virtually every model that is able to produce a 1.5 degree scenario um, of course you know the more the more you rely on that uh, the 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 less or the the more you rely on that the more the more you you suffer if it doesn't work out as favorable as possible so i'm glad you talked about a uh, a combination of different possibilities and that's actually a, a really nice transition to the next thing that I wanted to ask you Vicky was was really about what might be kind of game changing disruptive technologies or paradigm shifting technologies or things that would it, a, affect methane and, and and is it the ability to to capture emissions that that changes the whole footprint of the uh, of the oil and gas sector is it something related to say the observations that we we saw other people highlight that the satellites can now see the large emissions and with we were just hearing about methane sat from edf if that will enable us to see very small ones will that change the way industry works or what would you expect is on the horizon for oil and gas well, I, I think that um, when we talk about disrupting and game changing, I think our direct air capture facility is one because a lot of people have said you can't build it. You can't uh, build one that large and make it commercial. And, um, and well, what I say to that is just, just watch us because we will and we can and we have to. <laughs> uh, the second thing is I, I think that um, we are trying to also develop a an emission free electrical power generation technology. We have a pilot plant that's running and it's uh, operating um, well now and we'll we'll be building that in scale uh, as we go. And that is it, what it does is it takes um, uh, hydrocarbon gases, burns it with oxygen and and creates a pure stream of CO2 off of that, but a lower cost of electricity so that we can then the, the CO2 is essentially captured in the process. So that's, a, I think, a, a game-changing technology because anywhere there are hydrocarbons, we can, hydrocarbon gas, we can take that and generate electricity with it. That's no emission. So that's, I think, uh, potentially disruptive and game-changing. But then I think that uh, what I'd mentioned earlier is I believe with greater focus on it and attention, 
uh, I am have been so impressed over the last two to three years by what our employees have been able to do in the oil and gas industry and our chemicals business. So I do believe there's still yet to happen that that next decade of technology that we need to apply to our oil and gas business. We we still have the same pumping units out in West Texas that we had 60 years ago. So there is the opportunity to look at this differently and to just when you when you set a goal and you say we're going to eliminate by this much, then that starts to drive innovative thinking and ingenuity. And I think that's happening within our company. I think it's happening within other companies. And I think we just have to um, to collaborate more to ensure we advance that faster. But I think the the game changing technology that's going to lower methane emissions is to get out of this mode of thinking that what worked 15, 60 years ago is mm. still in place today is going to be OK for tomorrow. It's not and it has to change. Well, I whole, wholeheartedly agree with that. We have to we have to change the the way we've been operating. And and of course, we're we're really concentrating on methane today in the long term. I, th I think there is there is no solution to to getting us uh, substantial reductions in in fossil fuel use to meet to meet our CO2 targets as well. And that's why, for example, in the methane assessment, we talk about the transition as part of the additional measures uh, complementing the, the, the near term focus on targeted measures. I want to want to go to a, a kind of broader view and step back a little bit from any particular sector. And as both of you are in the, the industry of side of things, of course, um, you know, we've had a lot of, to, to my mind, very encouraging presentations in the keynotes about how much is being done, how countries are committed, how international organizations like UNECE and IEA are committed to action. And yet our emissions are still going up rather than down. So the question, and I'll, I'll direct this first to you, David, you know, you talked as well about how there's lots of uptake. The technology is is being picked up by millions of farmers and large scale operators and in, in advanced countries. Is is this going to be enough without some broader global convention or treaty or the kind of thing that that the UNECE representative was talking about? Do, do we need a, a worldwide price on greenhouse gases? Do we need a convention or a treaty like we have for the ozone layer and for mercury? Or can we continue kind of in our different countries and different sectors and financing everything kind of bottom up? What What do you think, David? Well, listen, I've been doing environmental activism, Drew, for the last 30 years, okay? Um, so it's, 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 it's sort of uh, refreshing to be on a, on a panel with Vicky. Uh, from Occidental Petroleum um, because, you know, in, in the days when I was working for Greenpeace, we were trying to shut her down. <laughs> so, uh, um, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is that um, there, I think all, all of your speakers have said that there is no time to lose um, and we have gone too slowly. We have um, been uh, accepting the resistance and the pushback which there have been and I'm sorry Vicky from you and your colleagues uh, throughout the United States but also throughout the rest of the world uh, to stop um, the uh, the transition into uh, into other cleaner energy sources and and also into into energy reduction energy prevention the cleanest energy is the stuff you don't use um, and uh, you know things like uh, insulation of buildings you know I wrote a book a year ago about all this and and, and one of the things I saw in this was that the biggest building company in, in the United Kingdom spent millions lobbying against the new insulation regulations um, so that uh, it wouldn't cost them a few dollars on, on the bottom line because you know they would have to put more insulation in the buildings that they built so industry has been pushing back and, and, and whatever great initiatives we hear it's not enough now, I have long been an advocate of uh, a global carbon tax. It's obvious that we're still a long, long way away from that. But we have a, a European carbon tax now, and it's 50 euro. It's 50 euro a ton, $60 a ton today. We have a UK carbon tax now. It's 50 pounds a ton. It's about $75 uh, a ton today. Uh, we have carbon taxes uh, implemented across, I think, roughly 25% of global emission jurisdictions. 
Um, so we ha we are seeing progress. Uh, but everywhere you go and every meeting you go to, I, I work, for example, a lot on plastics and plastic pollution. Every meeting you go to, you will see the major plastic producers, and a lot of them are sitting down there in Texas where, where Vicky is now, saying that we're doing this um, voluntary initiative. Uh, we've put half a, a million dollars into this initiative. We've been supporting Indonesia on this initiative. And all these initiatives have taught me in 30 years of environmental action that they are all ways of buying time so that the existing business model is not disrupted. They, we need major disruption to the existing business models. Get over it. The time of fossil fuels has finished. Now, they're not going to go away tomorrow, but we have to be doing everything from yesterday, from the moment we get off of this webinar, to ensure that they go away as quickly as possible. And voluntary agreements are, are not going to do that. And all the, the wonderful things that, that Vicky's company is doing there uh, are not going to do that because they are a drop in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Because they are, that's just, a, they are beacons, if you like, to which we can look to and say, hey, well done. But they're not changing the paradigm. And the paradigm needs to, to, to change. I've written about this many times. Only through financial mechanisms will we get those changes because the world teaches us and the world economy teaches us that those who have got money don't want to let anybody else have it and to to get the money into the right places it means taking away from somebody we are still putting incentives into the into the global fossil fuel industry at a far higher rate than we're putting into renewable energy are we completely crazy but we're still doing it so in order to change the paradigm of the way in which we spend our money, we need global accords, we need tough government, government, governments, we need strong governance, and I'm not seeing enough of that today. Thank you, David. I, I think that, that that actually rings uh, as a very compelling argument that, that is not really restricted to just this panel discussion on industry, but really is something that I'm glad you brought up because of the whole way that GMI has been operating since its formation is a voluntary partnership, which as as you said, I like your words there, it's been a beacon, uh, but clearly the emissions are still going up. I want to I want to give you a chance to to weigh in here too, Vicky. Do, we, do you think a global more rigorous regime um, is is going to be required? Vicky, excuse me, before you reply, I just do not wish to be rude, but I have to leave in, in two minutes. So if I cut off, uh, that is not being rude. Uh, it's because I have a, a, a European Commission meeting that I have to go to now. So thank you. Then I, if we don't uh, David, see you again, thank you, David, for your participation. Over to you, Vicky. Thank you. And, uh, and David, before you go, I just want to say we may be a little drop, but we're going to create a bigger wave than you might think because we're working that hard. And I, I appreciate other, that. The other thing I'd say is uh, it's not just a it's not about fossil fuels only. I can't tell you how many times that I walk into some of these department stores and home building places and restaurants where when there are two op doors, I the first one opens, you almost get knocked down by the the cold air coming out. <laughs> we have to have everybody focused on this and you're not going to kill fossil fu fuels next year not in five years, not in 10 years, not in 20 or not in 30. So we have to have everybody on board with us, helping us to move toward doing the right things. And I can tell you that um, too many people are waiting on and companies within our industry waiting on there to be a price on carbon or carbon tax. They're waiting on that. And they keep saying that when it happens, then they'll do things. We're doing things ahead of that because in the United States, there is an incentive, just like there had been for solar and wind. There's an incentive to do some carbon capture and sequestration or use. And that's what's um, being propelled us to be able to do what we're doing. We still have to focus on generating value for our shareholders, but we figured out a way to do that while also capturing uh, CO2 from the air and from these industrial sites. So there are mechanisms in place today for companies to do things. They just have to want to do it and they have to be innovative enough 
to figure out how to make it also deliver value for the shareholders. That's what we're doing. I don't think that, uh, I think that the talk around carbon pricing in the US and worldwide, that's just giving, to David's point, that's just giving companies an excuse not to do anything today. And we cannot give them that excuse because that is not gonna happen anytime soon. I don't know if it's gonna happen anytime soon in the US, but I know there's not gonna be a global policy that sets in place that around the world. So it's a difficult thing to do, but companies should be taking advantage of the things that help them today to do the things they ought to do to lower their carbon footprint. Here, here. I, I have to leave you both and and, um, and thank you again for the invitation. Um, the uh, uh, Sam has the slides, by the way, which uh, I didn't present. Uh, and uh, please, please feel free to, to to circulate them to the audience. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thanks, David. Thank you, Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, we'll we'll say uh, we'll say so long to David, and I think we are uh, about finished with the time for our panel, um, which was was getting very lively there. Towards the end, I appreciate the the discussion and the candor. Um, in, indeed, it, it is hard to imagine a, a carbon price similar to what we have now in Europe. Um, I will note that those prices are that that David just talked about in Europe are far higher than what we called low uh, for low cost abatement measures. If you had such prices, you'd start to get nearly everything that I think the the different research communities, including the EPA, have addressed as methane methane potential. Uh, mitigation potentials, that is, um, would be at negative cost if you had a price on carbon such as what's available and what's the current price in the European Union. So that is an interesting way to go, but clearly a mixture. Um, I want to thank Vicky for, for her willingness to participate in this and uh, for the interesting insight into what, what the industry's point of view is and, and all the efforts being undertaken uh, to reduce methane. So thank you very much. I am going to turn the floor back over to Helen and appreciate everybody for um, participation and hope you all enjoyed the panel. Thanks again. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Vicki. And thank you, David, for sharing your insights. And for such a dynamic question and answer period, I, I think that's what we need. We need to have really robust conversation and, uh, and lively exchanges. Um, and thank you to our audience for submitting your questions for our panelists ahead of the event. It was very helpful for us. In closing, I would like to thank each of our speakers for taking part in today's event and making it such a success. Your insights and perspective as experts are extremely valuable as we move forward to accelerate our action on methane. The message is very clear. Deep reductions in methane emissions over the coming decade will be essential from both a climate change and an air quality perspective. We know the major methane sources and we have the technology required to mitigate them. Solutions exist. There are pathways for immediate implementation that will achieve significant emissions reductions, often at low or zero net cost. I think the conclusion is clear. Addressing methane is a win-win-win for climate, air quality, and for the economy. With this, I want to thank you all for participating in today's event. Thank you.